purely responsible for your physiological survival. So it's, um, I've explained the different levels of thinking, conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. And I know many of you or many of uh, the uh, uh, basically psychologists are interchangeably using unconscious and subconscious uh, similarly. But in fact, there's a lot of confusion. I myself had problems with that uh, for years trying to really understand. But if you divide it into three layers instead of two, it really makes sense. And it relates well to the development and the, of the brain. So the unconscious part of the brain is responsible, is active when you're unconscious. So think about it when you're put under anesthesia. So you're given the drug, you're put to sleep, and the surgeon is having a surgery on you. You're awake, you're alive, your heart's working, your lung is working perfectly. Who is controlling that? You're sleeping, you're, you're unconscious. It's the red scoop, the brainstem, the medulla oblongata, and the brainstem, the, the parts of the spinal cord. The reflex is another example. It's the reflexive part, which has pure physiology, and there's no sort of emotions or higher uh, thoughts involved in that. And this is another um, cartoon of the development of the three layers. So, which part is responsible for our addictive behaviors? Mm -hmm. It's the limbic system in the second scoop, the midbrain. And this is just some pictures of the anatom anatomical structures involved in the brain. Um, it's a little bit busy, but basically all I wanted to point out, the main structures are hat. So hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and thalamus, and a bunch of other structures. But basically, in terms of function, what is the major function? As I mentioned, it's mainly responsible for our subconscious, automatic, and reactive thinking. And it appears to be responsible for our emotional life, has a lot to do with formation of our memories. They all go hand in hand. And I'm going to break it down even another layer to explain how that happens, that everything falls very beautifully into, in place. So basically, the main functions of the limbic system are the four Fs. So food, fight, flight, and reproduction. So again, designed to help us survive. And a number of other things like memory, recognition, and learning. And so let's talk about how the brain functions and how um, we can relate that to our day-to-day -day lives and the how it's associated to obesity obviously and also how we can take control and make some change meaningful changes in our lives in a better way not only for obesity and managing obesity but in anything in life so the adult brain is about three pounds and most of that being water but in it consumes 20% of the total energy. Very, very high energy expenditure. It has 100 billion neurons or nerve cells. 100 billion. What's even more fascinating and what makes this two-legged creature separate from the rest of the 30 million species living on this planet is the way the brain is structured. And mainly, it's the synapses or the connections. There is 164 trillion ways that these nerve cells can talk to each other, which means there's a lot of possibilities. So this is the brain neuronal network and BNN. This has, been, this has revolutionized my own life. When I understood this, my life changed because it applies to everything. So these are the cells, the nerves, the neurons, and they talk to each other, right, between, these are the connections or synapses that I mentioned. So the way they exchange information, so how do they talk to each other? 
I'm talking to you, I'm communicating with you right now in English language. So you understand what I'm saying. How does one nerve understand what the other nerve is saying? You may know that we, we've been taught in medical school that it's the electrochemical exchange of information from one nerve to the other. So that means it's exchange of electrons, like electricity, from the one part to the other part of one neuron, and between the neurons is chemical exchange. So the neurotransmitters, the chemicals, pass from one nerve to the other, from one nerve to the other one, these chemicals called neurotransmitters are stored and they're released, they pass on information. So what happens is if this is the headquarters or the nucleus of the nerve cell, these are little uh, receivers sitting on the neuron. They receive the information, they process it in the nucleus, and they transmit the information through the axon to the next one. Input evaluation center output, like a computer. And through the synapse or synapse, like I said, is the chemicals. There's many different neurotransmitters. So how, do, how does a nerve know which transmitter to release, or a neurotransmitter to release? Uh, well, uh, that works with the, the structural component of the receivers. It acts like a key and a lock. So if there's a certain key, or if there's a certain lock, for example, sitting on the cell, there's a number of uh, neurotransmitters released, but only one or two of them are the lock that match this. So if it sits on it, it unlocks the key and sends the signal again to the next one. So this is what we were taught in school, electrochemical. But now, new things are coming out. Another fascinating thing is that there's the magnetic field that can affect nerves. And that opens a whole world. Basically, we're beginning to understand how our brain and how our thoughts, we are communicating distance, remotely. We're beginning to understand the science of telepathy and karma and the vibes, what we call gut feeling. Somebody comes in, so, ooh, that's, here's a negative vibe. What does that mean? So the magnetic field is, we're just beginning to explore and understand those more. So what happens when you, um, when you uh, process information, when you experience something? Anybody here play music? Yeah. Any pianists here? There we go. So what's your name? Phyllis. Phyllis. Do you remember the first day that you were learning piano? Maybe, maybe not. A long time ago. Long time. <laughs> so, okay, think about it. It's your first day that you're learning piano. Okay? So your teacher tells, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, right? Every time you press the, on the Do key, there's a certain sound. Do, 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 right? So think about what's happening in our brain. So with that experience, a certain sound, it's, it's an experience that's transmitted through the nerves, to the spinal cord, to the brain, and a certain footprint is registered in our brain. Usually when it's our beginning, in the beginning, because we're not so used to it, we're actively thinking about it. We're using the conscious part of the brain until we become uh, used to it later on, like driving, after a while you get used to it, I bet you, you don't think about where to put your next finger now when you play with that. <laughs> exactly, why? Because you have, you know it, it's automatic, it's subconscious. So what's happening is that there's a fingerprint or there's a footprint in, registered in the brain with every copy, with every experience, a copy goes to your memory. So when you solidify it, and repeat it, play piano four hours a day, what happens is that these get solidified and certain patterns, sophisticated patterns, bond and develop very solid bonds between those synapses that I was mentioning 
They are not hardware, they're software, so they become strong. And a copy goes to your second layer. So basically, you start off with your third layer, or the green scoop, but with practice, you get, you master it. And you start using it, using your second part, because it's, it's in your memory. And the circuits become much faster, you don't think about it anymore. Similarly, when you're riding a bicycle, similarly when you're driving with anything else in life. So that's just how the brain works. So why is that important? And what does this have to do with obesity, by the way? Am I getting distracted? Well, not really. It has a lot to do because what we can do, we can actually, if we understand this, we can undo certain patterns. So if we have developed a bad habit, if we have become addicted, so the, this same pattern works for positive things and negative life, uh, things in life. So if you master music, you, get, um, you, you become an expert in music, you get a, become a good pianist, but similar mechanism works when you take drugs every time you get stressed, when you eat, when you have binge eating. So you develop certain patterns of response to certain experiences. And in the case of food addictions and any other addictions, uh, there are certain neuronal pathways in the brain that are activated, the, mainly the dopaminergic ones. There are several neurotransmitters involved, but mainly it's the dopamine one. And these are some of the pathways. The blue line is the dopamine ones. Excuse me. Um, um, these are some of the centers. Uh, I'll just name a couple of them. The nucleus accumbens and the VTA or ventral tegmental area. These are the main pleasure areas in the limbic system that are associated. So every time you're distressed, you may respond to it. And what happens when you take drugs or when you go drink alcohol if you're distressed? Two things happen. You forget about that temporarily about the distress. And by the way, you feel good, right? So two things, running away from the negative distress and now hanging on to something positive and pleasurable, that's very good. So it really sticks in your brain. Problem is, it's only for short term. And as soon as the effect wears off, there's the withdrawal. Now, it's a whole other, I'm not gonna get into it, but there's a whole mechanism of how addictions actually become, uh, become stronger and the, the limbic system responds to that, then you're gonna need more and more and more. So it's really related of how the brain is, is uh, functioning. So, so what happens is that uh, we usually respond in certain ways when we're distressed. If you have a negative feeling, some people respond to that in a negative way. Some people respond in a positive way. So you either, most people take, unfortunately, negative actions. So if you break it down into destructive and constructive actions, or it could be destructive and constructive thoughts, that's a reaction to a certain distress or stimulus that happens externally. So if somebody you know, swears at me, or internally. It may be just a bad memory that I happen to remember, that's a stimulus that turns on that signal. So most people, unfortunately, develop destructive coping mechanisms. Alcohol, drugs, binge eating, gambling, pornography, etc. name it. But there are other ways that you can constructively react to that. <coughs> some people exercise when they get distressed. Some people read. Some people journal. I usually journal. I used to, I play uh, guitar, so uh, I used to play guitar whenever I was distressed and later on, um, for some reason, I don't remember exactly when, but I started journaling. So what I do when I get distressed, oftentimes, I try to First of all, not respond immediately. I get emotional, I get angry, I want to do something bad. But the other part of my brain says, this is not the right time to make any decision. Just wait. So 
And I wait long enough, and I go down, and I'm still angry, I'm still upset. So I write it down on the piece of paper. I write my feelings down. Why am I angry? Why am I upset? So I'm doing self-cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And in this process, oh, sorry. In this process, number one, you know, first of all, I start feeling better as soon as I do that. And I try to understand myself. And by the way, it's a self-reflection that I start to really learn more and more about myself when I do this. So, so one of the things that we recommend, and uh, um, I assume that you in, in CBT, many of you may be use, using, is to substitute a negative defense mechanism with a positive one as well, because the person needs some sort of defense mechanism. I mean, we are always exposed to stress. We cannot avoid it. We have to respond to it. So the way we respond to that, as Adler mentions, right, and you have it on the, on the, uh, on the poster on, uh, on BCACC, um, it's the way we respond to experiences and situations that determines who we are. So, but think about it. Why do some people res uh, respond negatively and others respond positively? Why do you think that is? Yes, but, but why? Why are some people become criminals as a result of those repeated ex experiences? Why does Tina become a binge eater? Why does another person become um, a writer as a result of pain? Why does somebody become a boxer, a champion, as a result of those pains? Everything turns is based on our defense mechanisms, of the defense mechanisms of the ego. Depending on which mechanisms we use, starting from day one of life, and strengthening those defense mechanisms, remember the BNM? We are strength, we are actually drawing neuronal pathways in our brain and we are determining our own fate from day one by using specific defense mechanisms. So why do we have so many problems today in the world? Why do we have mass shooters? Why do we have criminals? Why do we have so much depression, so much anxiety? One of the problems is that The more destructive, the younger we are, we use the more destructive defense mechanisms without knowing it. Because the parts of the brain, the more immature parts of the brain are developed, the more mature ones are not developed yet. So in a two-year-old, if they are abused, if they are raised in a dysfunctional family, they have to respond to that. The child uses the more, the level one, the psychotic mechanisms up to age five, because that's the only part of the brain available. So that child starts using those destructive defense mechanisms, which is available at that time, which is okay at the time. But the problem is, if it's a chronic situation, a recurrent situation, and that child is always exposed to fear and abuse and responds to that negatively, starts building the BNN in a negative way. For example, denial is a good example. So what happens if you scare a child? You, know, you scare the child, oftentimes you see the child cover the face. Right? Why are they doing this? They are denying the existence of a threat. So that stimulus of fear is perceived as a threat. But the child doesn't know. The child doesn't know. 
but the subconscious part of the brain knows. It's already using denial of external reality as a defense mechanism to get away from that, to react to that. And if a child is born in a very dysfunctional family and repeated exposures solidifies those immature defense mechanisms, and one of the reasons, not all, but one of the reasons of schizophrenia is this concept. So seen also in psychosis. The same defense mechanisms, so they, they, they are delusional. They start making false beliefs. They start creating things, fantasizing things. That's what ch children do. They fantasize <laughs> as a way to either be creative. It could be in a positive way, but it could be also in a negative way. So one of the things that schizophrenic patients do, they are delusional. They're psychotic. They create things in their mind that doesn't exist. They create stories, but in their mind, it's real. They, it's, it's, it's absolutely real. You, you will see their reactions when they're talking about certain things. They say, like, what are you talking about? Oh, don't you see that police cop chasing me? And, and it's fearful. It's real for that person. So George Vailant, Professor George Vailant from Harvard University, he did a very, very uh, beautiful job, elegant job, in, in putting these and categorizing all the different defense mechanisms that are known today, which there's over 40 of them today. Um, in four categories. In the 1980s, he basically wrote a book describing all this. And so level one is the least mature, level four is the most mature. So as you are going up, basically, the level four ones are used more by the mature parts of the brain. That's the third scoop. The other ones, are mostly used by the subconscious mind, okay? And I am brutally oversimplifying this whole mechanism. So just be aware of that. So, you know, some of the things. So what happened, for example, in Tina? So the level two, one of the defense mechanisms is acting out. You get angry, you go out and break a window. You feel relieved. It's called acting out. You get in a fight with somebody. Another way is binge eating. Binge eating is a way of acting out again. For example, level uh, three, displacement. You know, the level three is neurotic mechanism seen in everyone, in most healthy people, right? Displacement is a good example, and I use this often. You know, you get in a fight with your partner or with your friend, you go home, your dog comes to show some love, you kick your dog. So you're displacing your anger and frustration from one place to your dog. The more common ones, uh, the, the, the healthier ones, are the level four ones, sublimation. So love sublimation, um, as many of you know, is the turning, uh, it's the, the prototype is the boxing champion, for example. Many great people. Many scientists, many artists, what they do basically, they are turning their negative experiences into a positive one, which is socially acceptable, and they practice it and practice it. That boxer, you know, every time he gets the stress, goes in the ring and starts practicing, showing their anger to the. So ultimately, what happens is that that person masters it and turns into a champion. Maybe not intentionally, but they get good at it. So that's the critical uh, importance and significance of these, of understanding these defense mechanisms. That doesn't just apply to obesity, but it applies to our day-to-day -day life. So like I said, it's important to understand to stop those negative patterns that are developing at early age. That's why one of my sort of key areas of interest is, well, two areas. I'm focusing on public education, specifically on two areas. One is obesity, and specifically childhood obesity, because it's the source of many other chronic diseases biologically. 
and also early childhood development, the first five years of your life, that's when you can determine the fate and the destiny of your child. So if we educate the uh, parents, pregnant parents, and in fact the stimuli, as, you, as you, many of you may know, doesn't start after birth. It starts before that. And there's a lot of science and evidence on these things. That um, So what we want to target is pregnant parents until their children reaches the age of five to give them the tools, give them the knowledge to be aware and help shape their child's brain because they're shaping their child's destiny and future. So in summary, obesity is a multifactorial chronic disease. It increases all cause mortality and we talked about the TFA triangle, we talked about the BNN which is very, very core. We talked about the defense mechanisms and um, so if, if I wanted to um, leave you with a couple take home messages. One is the, uh, to, to teach maybe our children to think, to think consciously, to start thinking more and more our third layer of the brain. The only way we can develop it is by using it. So remember that any time you're in your comfort zone, you're probably using your second layer, right? You're playing the piano, it's easy, and talking. You're driving and then you're talking to your partner, and you're thinking about your bill, oh, what was my schedule? Oh, I have a talk tonight, yeah. Well, what about the road? Who is controlling that? The second part, the second layer is doing the habitual things. Anytime you're out of your comfort zone, it's a new world. That's when you start using the third brain, and that's when you start developing it. So that's why you, you, you hear, you know, you've got to constantly challenge yourself if you want to grow constantly. So the, the, the rule to personal growth is challenge yourself, stimulate your brain. And now the studies are showing for dementia, Alzheimer's. One of the ways, and I mean, consistently studies are showing that dementia and Alzheimer's are lower in highly educated people. One reason is they've been constantly challenging and using the brain. So one of the things we tell our patients, especially the elderly, is find something new to challenge. Go dancing. Do what you wouldn't dare do regularly. Start a new journey, a new chapter in your life. Challenge yourself, because what you're doing, you're forcing your brain to develop new networks, new branches, new neurons, new patterns. And because of that, you're growing and you're becoming stronger. So it's an ongoing thing. It's not only for the young age. It's from day one to the last day of life. The other message is so if you have um, clients that you're dealing with, especially when it comes to any addictive patterns or behaviors, you need to give them some tools to be able to place their negative defense mechanism. Otherwise, you can't just say, well, quit smoking. Thanks. <laughs> and I hear this all the time. Patients come to me as, I'm frustrated my, with my own family doctor. Well, why? Because, you know, just tell me, you know, go eat properly and, and exercise more and you'll lose weight. Duh. As if I don't know that. But I can't. You know, I've got all these problems. I can't. Or the doctor tells me, you know, um, don't smoke anymore. Just quit. Just make a decision and s s stop smoking. Well, I know it's bad, but I can't stop. I need help. Drug addicts. Any addictive behaviors, similar pattern. So you see, it's it's like a uh, fundamental principle. So if we understand the fundamental principles of humanity, we can take it. We can take humanity to the next level. Sailing boats. 
has been around for, what, 5,000 years. But it wasn't until Archimedes, I think it was 212 BC or AD, if I'm not mistaken, discovered the physical fundamentals that navigation was taken to the next level. Similarly, flights. We, we, um, we take planes um, every day today, but it was because of a Swiss uh, scientist, Bernoulli, who discovered the principal laws of Bernoulli that aircraft and um, aerodynamics, air navigation was taken to the next level. Because of that, today we're going to the moon back and forth. We're going to outer space. So if we understand the principles, the fundamental principles of why things are happening in a scientific and truthful way, not voodoo medicine, not magic, you know, and then everything changes. It's like a tree, you know, I always use this tree as well, and I, um, I don't have the slide here, but when I'm talking about uh, obesity and the source of many other problems, and early childhood developments leading to many other mental disorders, it's like a rotten tree. So what we're doing in the healthcare system today is it's a tree with a lot of rotten fruits. What we're dealing with the fruits themselves. We're trying to fix those fruits. Diabetes, heart failure, you know, cancer. We physicians, <laughs> we physicians are part of the system, but it's really the system. We can't blame anyone. It's the system that is flawed because we're dealing with the rotten fruits alone. Where we need to address is the, the root of the problem and the rotting is in the root of the tree. It's in the trunk of the tree. It's where we don't see it. It's not obvious. It's under the ground. So if we can't reach under the ground, at least we can address at the trunk level, at the stem level. We are putting all our resources at, on the fruits. We're not going to get anywhere with that because there's only, be, there's only going to be more and more and more fruits. Welcome to the baby boomers with the aging population. If we have five times more, as many physicians and healthcare providers and psychologists, we will not be able to catch up with the growing population's demand of illnesses until we change our vision and start looking at things differently and change our culture. That's what the third vision is all about. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions.